uh, thanks so much for inviting us. Um, looking forward to to sort of presenting what what we're doing within the open open drone map ecosystem. How it might be relevant to uh, some of the things that you all are doing in the Red Cross uh, network, and um, and give you an overview of of sort of what sort of the realm of the possible. It's only an hour, so um, you know a couple of these slides are things that I would be happy to talk about for an hour, and I'd probably be the only one happy. So this is probably the right length. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk. Um, I guess I should pause by verifying you see my screen, right? Looks good. Cool. So the the basic principle of photogrammetry is being able to create measurable uh, data from photographs, from from photographs that that aren't necessarily um, inherently measurable, uh, and um, so my background is in, uh, well, so my uh, my current position is as a systems administrator with focus on research support at Oberlin College and Conservatory. Um, and there I'm, I do uh, research support for faculty, work with students, uh, run their, uh, their uh, high performance computing cluster, so a supercomputer. Um, but relevant to, to what we're talking about today, uh, I, a few years back started uh, the project called Open Drone Map which now in conjunction with all the wonderful things that Pietro Tofanin and other contributors have brought to it, has become a whole ecosystem of tools that allow you to do really great um, image processing uh, using, using imagery from drones and from the ground. Uh, lately, I've sort of been specializing in what are, how, how can we create large scale elevation models from photogrammetry. So you've got uh, a region that you really wanna map in detail and you wanna understand flood risks, uh, we've been working through some really interesting uh, problems in that space where we can take tens of thousands of images uh, collected at scale and turn those into uh, elevation models that are suitable uh, for, for uh, coastal flood modeling, for uh, surface modeling, and for riverine modeling. Um, and then a couple of other things that I've done over the years, the co-authored uh, the Posters Cookbook, I blog quite a bit at smilymelee.com, and, and I can fly a drone if I'm allowed to. All right, uh, my, my name is Corey Snipes. I'm an, it, by trade, I'm an aerospace software engineer. I, I sort of split my time between uh, a, a lot of software, a medium amount of data processing and a little bit of, of drone piloting. Um, I'm a part 107 certified pilot in the US. Um, I like to focus on mapping and modeling in, in kind of urban development and, and coastal contexts. I'm also active with the local our uh, regional industry trade group here, the North Coast Drone Alliance. I'm based in, in Cleveland, Ohio, where I think it is almost 10, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I need some help with the Celsius <laughs> <laughs> conversion there, but it is, it is not warm, but it is sunny. So I'm delighted about that. I think our next slide is the agenda, so I can run through that and then uh, Steve will kick us off. So we'll walk through what, what is Open Drone Map, um, talk a little bit about the uh, but go ahead, you can just click through these, it's fine. Um, we'll talk about the benefits, some of the things that the software does. We'll talk a little bit about um, outputs. Steve, um, Steve will talk through some use cases, especially use cases uh, that are relevant for this group. And then I will talk a little bit about just how to get, get started with the software. Um, and then Steve and I will both talk a little bit about architectural alternatives and kind of field and regional deployment, that kind of stuff. So, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with some resources on uh, where to get more information, if this is of interest to you, and also how to get involved in the community. All right. Over to you, Steve. The first question of what, what is. Um, so I like this. This is an animation from webodm.net. Um, webodm.net is, is sort of part of the overall ecosystem of tools. The cool thing about an open source project is we can have lots of different uh, folks involved and lots of folks uh, involved in different in different ways. Uh, so Dan and, and your network is 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 deeply involved in, in Open Drone Map uh, and has been for a long time and a, and a huge contributor to the ecosystem. Um, WebODM.net is is another of those things. So started in 2014 with really the significant improvements and uh, and changes in output quality, features, and usability beginning when, uh, when Piotr Tofanin uh, sort of co-founded the ecosystem in 2018. So the um, it's an open source toolkit for photogrammetry from UAS imagery and other uh, other cameras. 
So that could be, you know, that's basically take a bucket of images and turn them into geographic products. Um, what's been kind of exciting has been to see the growth of it uh, as it's been used really at, at a global scale across all sectors. So we see use in government, and this is not this is not a comprehensive list, but we know that it's used uh, in in uh, by Cleveland Metro Parks, by Korea National Park Service, by the U.S. Department of the Interior, and by a range of other uh, government actors across the world. Uh, in the NGO space, we know that it's used by Red Cross, World Bank, UN, and then in the private sector, there are tens of thousands of users. So just of webodn.net, there's there's roughly 20,000 users, uh, and there's lots of users using it in lots of different ways in their own in their own uh, in their own ways. Um, and that applies to both private sector, uh, you know, sort of the the the, the formal, uh, the more formal commercial uh, context, and then a range of hobbyists. So there's a whole spectrum of users from from sort of the the the, the smallest to the largest, um, really employing and contributing to that ecosystem. Um, our goals are really to uh, have applications in the humanitarian space to really help with humanitarian problems, whether that's uh, whether that's uh, capturing the state of things uh, uh, at at the end of a uh, of an incident, or uh, on the preparedness side, which I think we're uh, at this point a little bit more. Um, uh, suited for. Um, focus is really on uh, also on ecology and conservation. The project itself came out of uh, my time with uh, Cleveland Metro Parks. So there's a strong sort of uh, there's a strong bias towards uh, projects that um, that are ecological in nature. And then uh, a whole lot of research applications. And my personal interest in is really data for the public good. So how do we generate data sets that that are um, commonly created, perhaps, but not necessarily commonly held, um, that are uh, that are generated for the public good. And to do that, we we have to have a good funding model. We have to think through how how we make sure that this is sustainable over the long term. It's not just uh, a, a couple of developers and you know it, it, it scattered across the globe, but that we've got a, a steady stream of funding that that allows us. And, and funding in the broad sense, but that allows us to um, to continue the work uh, that we're doing, so that this becomes a good public asset and maintained and and is sustainable as a public asset. So community contributions are are sort of the the base for all of that. Um, but in addition to that, um, we've uh, secured funding from a range of different uh, entities over the, over time, starting with Cleveland Metro Parks, LHRA's Humanitarian Innovation Fund. Uh, really helped us scale and, and make this more usable, uh, particularly for uh, folks in the humanitarian space. Um, we've done some focus projects with World Bank Tanzania and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, um, and that's really allowed us to, uh, to to dip our toe into the water of massive data sets. Uh, so if we look at the kind of work that's been done in Dar es Salaam and uh, and uh, in, Tenz in uh, Zanzibar under the Zanzibar Mapping Initiative, they've been working at the questions of flood resilience uh, in earnest uh, since since 2016. And so the kinds of data sets that they've gathered in Tanzania have been fantastic and challenging and and really great for sort of understanding how exactly we can build larger projects that aid in resilience. Uh, we've been really fortunate and, and, and really lucky to have folks like Dan work with us at the Red Cross, um, both on the funding side and on the development side and on the documentation side. Uh, and that's been a real that's been a real pleasure. And that's been that's been since roughly 2017 uh, that we've had uh, some sort of interaction there. Uh, Korea National Park Service has provided some funding and has deployed this across uh, across their parks uh, and done extensive training. Uh, with their with their park service professionals in the use of this uh, for monitoring and assessment across the uh, Korean national parks. And then a lot of our funding actually comes through sort of projects that feed into open drone maps. So I'd be I would be remiss to not talk about open SSM, which uh, which was started by Mapillary, uh, been sucked into the into the Facebook uh, uh, engine, uh, but continues to be quite viable and, and to be developed quite actively. And OpenMVS, which uh, which is a fantastic uh, project out of 3D Innovator, and then um, probably dollar for dollar, one of the largest 
uh, funders over the years has been webodm.net, um, where it's used by a lot of folks. So one thing that's important to the ecosystem is to not just have this be something that, that only um, really computer-oriented geeks can use, but something that is uh, sustainable and deployable and usable by a range of different folks who have different special specializations and different areas of expertise and interest. Um, and part of how we do that is, is through uh, commercial support. So there are other projects. So there's there's really a range of really good, both cloud hosted and uh, installable uh, photogrammetry tools um, that are available now uh, that you can pay for. Um, so the question is, why would you go with an open source project? Why would you go with with Open Drone as as, uh, as the solution? And the thing that people mostly often think about is sort of accessible to orgs with limited budgets or with uh, with budget with expenditure challenges. Uh, maybe the budget's not limited, but the allocation is there for this kind of work. So this can work, be work as a pilot in those kinds of situations, or it can be a sustained uh, project for, for doing photogrammetry. Um, and this can save anywhere from a few hundred dollars a month to a few thousand dollars for a lifetime. Um, and Open Drone Map is free as in freedom forever. But I think what's actually more important and more compelling for me is that this allows people to have control over the tool chain. So Dan needs a feature implemented in a commercial closed source package. He's got, he's got a little leverage. You know, he can he can he can uh, he can provide some leverage uh, from that Red Cross perspective to get things done. But within an open source project, he has even more leverage. He has even more control. He can do direct contribution, or he can fund development, or he can. Um, uh, you know, ask for and advocate for changes and additions uh, to the software. And that's something that in a proprietary ecosystem, there's a bit of a wall around those kinds of changes and those kinds of kinds of controls. And then there's another aspect of control, which is when we look at institutions that have to sustain over long periods of time, that have to, that have missions that never really end, when, when we, Engage, when, when we as actors within those contexts, so I'm speaking sort of uh, working at, at a governmental entity for, for more than a decade, the challenge that we have as actors in sustained organizations is at any time, that proprietary model can change. At any time, those doors can close and that software can be taken away. So particularly for things, for tools that are really important for core parts of what we're doing within a mission, it's important to have control over that. It's important to know that that, that tool will be around and available uh, in the future. Um, I think there's an opportunity to, as, this, as we collectively create this public good, that we have a collective wisdom and a collective understanding and collective, you know, collective knowledge about how to do really interesting, uh, solve really interesting problems. And then with that greater transparency, we get better quality and security. Um, there was recently a project that uh, that a colleague of mine was working on in Monrovia where, I think it was, no, where was it? No, I don't remember where it was, but anyway, there were some challenges associated with it and someone said, well, we should use this tool over here because this tool doesn't do X, Y, and Z. And the reason they thought that that tool didn't do those things is because there's no transparency. In fact, that tool does under the hood do these other things that they're trying to avoid doing, but because there's no transparency, they don't know that it exists. So that transparency also really helps with questions of decision making. What are the things that that need to happen, and what are the things that we want to happen, and how do we ensure that um, that we understand what's happening under the hood? Um, open source also gives us standards-based and public good things because, much like any other infrastructure. We we don't want to we don't want to hand the keys of the kingdom as it were over to uh, someone for fundamental infrastructure. So we don't want we don't want just we don't want just one company to be able to handle our infrastructure and our plumbing um, in much the same way our technological infrastructure uh, needs to be a public good. And then here's something that could easily be a presentation all on its own. The slide and this last bullet point: um, the use of proprietary software in the aid sector. Uh, perpetuate, perpetuates racial injustice. And Ivan Gaten, at the top of his blog right now, has that uh, has a has a, a, a fantastic rant 
on why that's the case um, and what uh, free and open source software um, does better in that case. Back over to you. All right. Thanks. I'll remember to start my video this time. Okay. I think you might need to stop sharing. So, I oh, do. no, Sorry it's about letting me do it. No, that's fine. I'm good to go. All right. Okay. Should say capabilities. Let me know when you can see that. We can see it. Good. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. So, I'll talk a little bit about what um, Open Drone Map does walk through uh, just a really quick process of what it's like to import photos, get outputs. I'll talk about the 2D and 3D outputs. Um, and then we'll do some use cases after that. So this is the web ODM dashboard. It's a web-based dashboard. Once you install Open Drone Map, um, typically from web ODM, then this is a, an interface that you have. So I'll talk through a little bit about what's in here. A few slides later, I'll talk about the actual installation process. So I'm kind of jumping into, you already have an installed web ODM, but we'll go back and catch you up in a minute. So the dashboard itself has simple uh, control menu on the left, a list of projects on the right, and within each of those projects um, can be a set of tasks. So it's pretty general um, and I'll, I'll step through mostly what's here. So a project, um, the way that I work with ODM typically ends up being a specific uh, job site. It might be a ge geographic location, or it might be a you know a research, you know a set of research with with several sites. You can you can kind of um, set this up how you want. But projects are very general, and you can you can name them and categorize things however you like. Um, so this is my project here where the arrows pointing Cuyahoga West Third. Uh, this is a task. The task naming again is completely up to you. Probably you would you would come up with some scheme that makes sense to you. Um, number of photos in this task. So I've uploaded some some uh, drone photography. Uh, this is run a photogrammetry job, and this is a completed job. So you'll have um, some of these buttons uh, become available after the job is complete. So uh, that's number of photos in the job. This is the the amount of time that the job took. This is the job status. If it's running, you'll see something else. Um, and then there's a set of buttons here along the bottom below this task. Uh, downloading assets is one. You can also interact with the 2D outputs and 3D outputs right here in the browser interface, or you can download everything. Um, and typically you would do both. So to start the process, say I want to upload a new set of photos, create a new task. So I'll pick this select images button here. I have some drone photography already on my hard drive somewhere. Just pick the photos. Once those are selected, you pick a configuration. Default configuration is fine, especially when you're first getting started. Really, for the most part, there are a lot of configuration options here. Best to just start with the defaults because they're quite good. Um, and those default settings have had a lot of attention, so uh, they work really well. If you know, you know, the more you use it, the more you might find yourself wanting to uh, change up the configuration either by picking one of these presets or in this little gray box, you can, there, there's a whole set of parameters that you can configure as well. We won't go into those. Uh, just suffice to say, you've got some kind of high level presets here and default is typically fine, especially when you're getting started. Once you kick that off, you have a task output that you can turn on. I believe it's off by default. Uh, but I like to I like to tick this on so I can see log output and see what's going on. Especially some of these jobs take multiple hours to run. So um, if it seems like things are taking too long, or if it seems like it could be stuck, I like to have this uh, task output available. You can turn it on and off, but it helps me just to get a sense for um, how things are going, see progress. Once the job itself is completed, um, you'll get the job execution time here. As I mentioned, you can download your assets and this will give you, you can select, uh, this gives you a little drop-down menu. You can pick uh, only your 3D point cloud or only your textured mesh or uh, just your ortho photo. Or, um, there, I'll talk about all those things in a second, but you can download everything in a zip file or you can download individual things. You can also work with 2D outputs, ortho photos, um, that sort of thing here within the browser or the 3D outputs as well. 
2D outputs, typically dig digital elevation models, uh, surface models, terrain models, um, with or without contours. There's a lot you can do within the interface. Uh, plant health algorithms, if your drone data consists of uh, multispectral imagery, then that's process, processed for you automatically. Um, there are a number of algorithms that you can pick, different ways to look at it. But here's an example of a digital surface model. No, this is probably a terrain model, actually. Um, but you can pick, um, yeah. I'll tell you about the picking in a second, sorry. So digital terrain model there, um, contours here. You can, you can select your contour interval. It takes a little bit to calculate, um, but it'll run this for you um, if you want it. You can specify a projection. Um, you can specify which layer you want that applied to. You can preview it here within the browser. This will be within the browser, or you can export it, download that file. And then uh, here's plant health algorithms. Both the service model and the, the plant health alg algorithms, you can pick different color ramps um, for plant health, uh, your multispectral, different algorithms and filters you could apply here. You can also fiddle with um, um, the min and max for the color bands to get things kind of dialed into how you um, how it's useful here in the interface. And then as before, you can export it as a GeoTIFF. And then orthophoto, um, very typical. So this is just all of your uh, photographs stitched, 3D modeled, and then flattened. Um, so this is a georectified image that you can download. Work within the browser, but typically this, this, this would come out and go into your GIS software. Um, so examples of things you might do with these outputs, download, um, work with them in QGIS or ArcGIS, um, or take them and then uh, run them through some additional workflows for object detection and counting. We're seeing people start to do that. I mean, it's, it's just an image in some level. So these are certainly not limited to these, um, these tools, but we have, have seen people uh, starting to work with these um, for object detection, counting, plant counting, that sort of thing. 3D outputs, also calculated. Um, the dense point cloud is probably um, one of the two big ones here. So this is, uh, this is the 3D model that's generated by the, the photogrammetry process. Um, this is an example from a, an actual user from a, a year or two ago. Very clean. Good flight planning is, is definitely key here as well. Um, to get this level of detail, especially on the verticals, but um, it's certainly possible. And this point cloud, an example of something you might typically do would be to export it and then run it, in, run it through an additional piece of software such as Cloud Compare for um, you know, further analysis, comparing changes over time, that sort of thing. The other big 3D output is your textured model that sits on top of the uh, high resolution point cloud. Um, so this looks a little bit more photorealistic, um, but this is just a series of, um, you know, when you drill into it, it's just a series of points with triangular uh, colored mesh sitting on top of it. So all based on drone photography. This is downloadable, I think in multiple formats, um, but OBJ is very typical. And so you might pull this out and then uh, send it to another tool such as Sketchfab for sharing. Um, you might have CAD tools, something you wanna work with in, in CAD or Blender or other 3D modeling type software. Um, and ultimately you could, you can, uh, if you have enough tools chained together, you could uh, even take things and, and 3D print them. So beyond just the um, external analysis within ODM, there are a few tools um, that are pretty useful and basic and right there and easy to use including uh, measurement tools, linear volume measurement. Um, so th there's a set of tools that you can use on the orthophoto, and then there's another set of tools that you can use on the 3D model. So um, this lower one, it's a bit hard to see, but this is a, this is, um, a height profile. So just by drawing a line on the 3D model here, you can see um, the altitude of these various points along that little gully right there. So pretty easy to do just within the web interface. All right, 
Steve, I can switch back to you. Uh, Steve's going to talk about use cases. I can switch back to you, or you can, um, uh, or I can just click through your, your call. Uh, I think it's fine for you to continue. So there are lots of use cases that um, that we've come across over over time and and sort of developed and and developed the core software for. Um, one that started uh, roughly uh, three and a half years ago uh, was really focusing on how do we take multispectral inputs uh, from new sensors that are that were arriving on the scene at the time and actually turn them into uh, tangible products. Um, so that was a project that, that we piloted uh, during my time at Cleveland Metro Parks and then subsequently was uh, has been funded uh, by a range of different folks over time, including uh, some of the sensor developers. Um, and so the idea for this is that is that you can create vegetation indexes, which tell you something about what's happening uh, across the field uh, um, as far as plant health um, using spectra that um, that are correlated with or represent something about the characteristics of of that. Uh, that plants plant, that plants stress, whether that's whether that's water stress, uh, heat stress, or um, uh, or light stress, and um, and also sort of that taking it back, you know, usually a picture is the most important thing. The visual monitoring, the understanding of of sort of the pattern across the landscape of of what things look like um, and how to analyze that. Next. And then um, change detection or change documentation, I think, is is an important uh, part of, of what can be done with Open Drone Map. So um, one of the use cases, and this one sort of a bit more ecological, uh, was actually using Open Drone Map to process imagery from an area where a tornado had had passed through, and to do a force inventory based on that. But we can imagine scenarios where we're doing that with with buildings, where we're doing that with with uh, with, with use cases and and um, uh, emergency cases that that are less about the trees and more about the people. Um, in this case, uh, it it was it was a useful exercise to understand what the capable capabilities are of photogrammetric image processing. Like, can we even count the trees? Get uh, get detailed information about what is left um, and what has changed. Um, and you know, estimate replanting costs and efforts, and you know, what are the opportunities for repeat flights for monitoring progress? Uh, and a lot of those, a lot of those questions, which were piloted by uh, Carnegie uh, Museum of Natural History out of Pittsburgh, were just fantastic and, and cutting edge. And we kind of, we kind of <laughs> grabbed their coattails on that one, and and uh, and reprocessed some of their imagery. Uh, in Open Drone Map to see our capabilities as well. Next. And then there's a fair amount. When we look at um, restoration, reconstruction, construction, and construction changes, there's a lot of capability both within uh, WebODM uh, in the browser and with the data that you get from it for really tracking uh, progress. Uh, generating 3D models uh, and understanding how progress matches plans. And I think uh, Corey's done a bit of work in this. We've done a bit of work uh, when I was with the Metro Parks in doing this, where capital projects, part of the monitoring process and part of understanding how things change and how things match the plan and updating stakeholders um, is an important iteration process that's enabled uh, by drone use. And then we've actually seen <clears throat> I don't have any slides on this uh, because I don't actually have the data, but there's some really, really fascinating stuff coming out of uh, World Food Program doing documentation of, of dike changes and doing volumetric estimates uh, for fixes to dikes that have been breached. Um, so I think there's both sort of the documentation of ongoing changes, but also the opportunity to help do high level planning of projects and figure out uh, what what capacity is needed in order to uh, make fixes uh, within places that uh, are disaster prone or have uh, or have been uh, through a recent disaster. Next. And then we spent a lot of time on the question of ecological assessment at Cleveland Metro Parks, um, looking at both plant health, but also uh, measuring riparian changes and measuring 
actual mapping out uh, the extent of particular plant communities that either are invasive and therefore uh, areas that need attention uh, for removal or that are native and that really need either additional attention for maintaining and uh, protecting them from invasive plants or uh, in the case of, of this, this uh, image here, we actually were able to document where the invasive plants were, where the native communities were and the demarcation line between them. So we start to plan uh, you know, plan out multi-year campaigns for removal of the invasive species that start on that edge so that the native communities can move back in uh, in an appropriate way. And then there's a fair amount, um, and we're going to talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail in the, in the subsequent slides, but with the ability to get that three-dimensional or that two-and-a-half-dimensional information, having uh, ero having elevation information in a way that's easy to collect, easy to process, um, inexpensive, uh, and doesn't doesn't require manned aircraft, lidar systems, uh, or all the accoutrement of, uh, of that that may not be available as resources. Um, the 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 opportunity with open drone methods to really map in detail elevation models. So let's go to the next slide, and let's talk a little bit about that opportunity um, both within coastal and other zones. So whether we're looking at the question of capturing a coastal zone and repeating that over time through iterations and measuring the difference and change through time, or we're doing a static one-time uh, elevation model for hydrologic modeling, uh, we have a lot of opportunities. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into a case study for the next one, where we're gonna talk about what we did in conjunction with the Zanzibar Mapping Initiative. So, Zanzibar Mapping Initiative uh, is a massive, massive project uh, in the Zanzibar Archipelago, uh, um, funded by funded by the Tanzanian Urban Resilience Program, with uh, uh, ultimately through UKID, uh, led by uh, led by a range of different partners, including, of course, the Revolutionary Government of Zanzibar. Their primary um, the primary product for this was was aerial photography. So the Lands uh, Commission for Zanzibar was very interested in the question of uh, land rights, land tenure, uh, and needed a good up-to-date map. So rather than, rather than commissioning that through some relatively, multi, relatively expensive multi-million dollar process, this was a project to massively scale for hundreds of thousands of dollars with local drones in the field, uh, with some fantastic uh, uh, early career folks like uh, Hadija Abdullah Ali and uh, Yusuf Saeed Yusuf, uh, flying basically the entire archipelago with a team of a dozen of their of their close colleagues at the University of Zanzibar um, to create an updated map for Zanzibar. So what we worked with, uh, what we worked with. Let's go to the next slide. Um, ZMI and and, uh, and and TERP was to scale the elevation model uh, to that whole range of areas, and it, the the results are really fantastic. The details, um, if you're if you're at all into into uh, coastal geology, the details are absolutely fantastic. With just um, really cool coastal features, um, which are uh, mapped in more detail than anyone's had before. And probably a huge opportunity for um, for the ecological side of things. But if we go to the next slide, the the really interesting thing for this project was merging this with uh, an existing uh, uh, Merit Hydro uh, DPM, which by default is uh, I think 90 meter resolution. So uh, this elevation product uh, ended up being a five meter resolution. And what we were able to create um, in this project was one seamless product, which allows for fantastic coastal fluvial and fluvial modeling of flooding across Zanzibar City um, that is unprecedented in detail, unprecedented in quality, um, but also not all that resource intensive. So from a financial resource perspective, um, this was inexpensive um, 
but also that resourcing didn't go to an exterior, you know, an, an external firm um, that came in, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't this case where you hire someone from South Africa or from Europe or from, from somewhere nearby to come in with a manned aircraft and fly it. But in fact, uh, those resources were used uh, to uh, work with and, and develop and extend local talents and, 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 um, and, uh, and then layer onto that the opportunity to be able to create hydrologic models and flood models uh, to improve resilience within Tanzania. So this was, this was a pretty exciting project. And I think um, probably, and I'm biased because I was involved in it, um, but probably one of the more interesting projects that's come out of Open Drone Map in the, in the last couple of years, the more interesting applications. I think it's back to you, Corey. Yes, thanks. I have not been monitoring for, for questions along the way. So Dan, please um, let us know if, if we should stop and spend more time on anything or, or uh, I'll just pause here and take questions. We, we have a little bit more material and then we have a question section at the end. So interrupt me if you need to, that's what I'll say. Yeah, so if anybody um, has questions on the materials so far, you know, speak up or if you are more comfortable typing some into the chat, uh, you can do that now or as we go and we'll, We'll loop back to those. It's uh, Brent Connolly here. Um, I work with Dan as a volunteer at the Red Cross. Uh, I was about to, I was halfway through typing a question, so I'll just verbalize it. I'm cur curious about the turnaround time you guys have seen teams or users have in terms of processing these images. I'm thinking of a like an active um, disaster situation where you need real time or close to real time data. How quickly are teams currently you know, processing and turning this kind of information around. Thanks. I, uh, Steve, do you want to speak to this? You know, I, that is probably the hardest part. I mean, um, maybe you could speak to it, or Dan may have a better sort of applied understanding of that and where the where the bottlenecks are there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say generally that, you know, jobs, depending on the, it depends a lot on the number of photos um, and you know, kind of the size of the data set that you're trying to process. I think a typical job that I would run on my data, which is very limited in scope, um, is going to be something on the order of 45 minutes to a couple of hours. Um, so certainly larger jobs um, would be longer than that, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's a matter of hours and not days typically, unless you're, I mean, if you're talking Zanzibar scale stuff, obviously, um, you know, it, it gets a little more expensive, but that's, that's me anecdotally. I'll let, I'll let Dan jump in with any, anything he wants to add there. Yeah, I think it's a little bit difficult just because the number of variables, um, the number of images that you're trying to process um, is the big one. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily directly relate to how much ground you've covered because five images taken at 50 feet flying height compared to five images taken at uh, 400 feet flying height covers a very different amount of area. Um, so you can potentially cover a very large area at lower resolution and process it relatively quickly due to it being a smaller number of images. Um, it just, it all depends on kind of your uh, desired end data state, uh, quality of the air end data, and um, some of the other parameters going into it. And also your, um, what you're processing it on. If you're doing this on uh, web infrastructure and can uh, spin up whatever resources you need on DigitalOcean or AWS, um, you can get things done a lot quicker than if you're doing it on a local laptop with you know, 32, 64 gigabytes of RAM or something like that. And the one, one, one advantage that you have um, well, one opportunity that you have if network uh, isn't as limited um, is is that is throwing more hardware at it. So if your data collection time uh, is in hours and you need uh, a product in hours, generally speaking, you can find a way to turn the knobs on on your hardware, um, especially if you're renting through through uh, DigitalOcean or AWS or another provider, and you can sort of turn up that, that um, that turn down that processing time by turning up that processing power. Um, there are some limitations. Um, not the entire uh, tool chain is 
is fully multi-threaded, um, which means that at certain points you do have bottlenecks in the in the process. Um, one of the things that we explored in processing uh, the Zanzibar mapping initiative data was how quickly could we do it. And the reality is for 20,000 images on the hardware that we were running, so we weren't rent, renting anything, um, but we could we could manage to get highest quality imagery. This is, I think, 300 meter uh, flight height. So um, effectively the ortho photo is uh, seven centimeter resolution. So very, very detailed over an area of, uh, I think 130 square kilometers, it took about four days to process. Um, now, it's fully possible to speed that up, uh, to rent different hardware, uh, and to make and to cut that down uh, by half or by quarter. Um, and to get to the point, I think, where realistically your, your bottleneck starts to be uh, the field portion, the bottleneck starts to be under, under a lot of conditions, how quickly you can collect the imagery, not how quickly you can process it. But use cases matter. Um, and uh, and there's, you know, there's a million, million different exceptions to that. I'll go ahead and run through the getting started uh, pieces just uh, in the interest of time. I know we have a, a few more slides, um, but I think we'll have uh, some ample time for questions at the end as well. So assuming that you have not used Open Drone Map, um, but you're interested in doing it, um, there are a variety of ways to get started. I'll try and kind of demystify this a little bit. There are a lot of ODM and Open Drone Map names thrown around on different components. As with many open source projects, um, there's a variety of ways of looking at it and a variety of levels of documentation on this. So you see a lot of names and it's not always that clear where to get started. So the general architecture of the way Open Drone Map is put together is there's a uh, essentially a backend processing and a tool chain that wraps up the structure for motion and photogrammetry pieces and takes the inputs and outputs. Um, started out as command line still you know, can, can be run from command line, but most people don't use it that way. But that's Open Drone Map is really kind of the processing engine in the background. And that might run on one or more servers. Where most people start with it is Web ODM, which is that, that web interface that I showed earlier. Um, and this is definitely the most friendly way to both install it and, and start to work with it. So um, unless you consider yourself uh, a superpower user and uh, just want to get into it, then uh, I would definitely recommend people start with WebODM. There's a piece in, in the middle here that's fairly transparent. You don't have to install all these things. You can really just kind of install WebODM and it'll pull in everything that it needs for you. But cluster ODM is a component that allows you to connect your Open Drone Map interface to multiple backend processing engines. And so if, you're, uh, if you have the sort of processing needs and a pipeline that requires a setup like this, um, you'll be looking at cluster ODM. You don't have, to, you know, this is not where you start. This is just kind of like at, at the top level for those tens of thousands of photos jobs. This is um, sometimes where you end up. So the architecture supports it. Um, and that's, I, I, I think probably the largest data sets that I've, I have seen people processing in the last couple of years or something on the order of 70 to 90,000 images. Um, and it's, as Dan mentioned, an, an image is, doesn't give, necessarily give you a certain re resolution because that could be different altitudes. It's just the number of photos really is, is what the software cares about. So that, that, these are probably the largest data sets that I've seen, seen people and it's non-trivial. Um, so I, we'll talk a little bit about getting started and that's, that's, that's not where you start, um, but it is possible to get there. Again, web ODM, if you're just looking for, all right, how do I, how do I install something and start playing with it? Web ODM is where to start. Um, yeah, and shout out to uh, Carol as uh, International Free and Open Source Software uh, Foundation who used Cluster ODM before anyone else other than the core developer. So mm -hmm. they deployed a fantastic cluster to map uh, wetlands uh, in Kerala that, uh, that are really high value and really important and also really flood prone. So. And it, yeah, I'll just add to that and say that this, you know, that is a great example of what, how free and open source software um, community contributions um, make such a difference. I mean, you know, that's not the sort of thing you would see in proprietary software, it's, but because it's, you know, it's open source and other organizations are re really able to push the boundaries and then contribute that back and everybody benefits from it. So, um, 
supported systems, if you want to install WebODM, uh, you have a couple of options. Windows 10 is very common. Um, there is a native install, which is new-ish. I'd say within the last year or so, we've got native installs. Previously, this was uh, started out as extremely complicated and then moved to Docker, which simplified it a lot, but still has another layer of kind of complexity involved with it. And uh, the native Windows install is the most recent iteration of that. You can still do it. Um, you can still install it through Docker if you want. Um, in fact, that's how I currently run it. But uh, Windows native install is definitely the easiest place to get started if you're on Windows. Um, if you're on Linux, you like Linux, there are um, native installation procedures that you can use, or you can just do it through Docker. Again, it's pretty easy there. Um, Mac OS, I see a lot, a lot less of this Mac OS discussion in the community, and I'm not personally familiar with it, but I know it's, it's supported at least to an extent. But by far, I would say that the, the most common um, operating systems are Windows and, and uh, Ubuntu Linux. You're going to want some kind of probably Windows or Linux um, system. This could be a laptop, could be a desktop. Um, the I think our stated documented memory minimum is either four or eight gigs, which is just not, you know, really not practically usable. I would my recommendation is always 16 gigs if you have some real data that you're interested in. Uh, like if you need if you need this to do uh, for work and not just for fun. Um, 16 gigs is the absolute minimum. Uh, it's you'll have a much better experience if you can get a machine with 64 or more, 128, 256. I know they're expensive but available. Um, RAM and disk space tend to be the biggest bottlenecks, and so the, there's a de definitely a, a high correlation between amount of uh, RAM and and happiness of ODM on your machine. Um, I usually say minimum 50 gig hard drive, but but uh, you know, especially if you're working with larger data sets, then more is better. And hard drive space is pretty cheap. For your very first work with OpenDrumM, I always suggest that people start really small. Don't, don't take a thousand image data set that you've got sitting around and throw it at ODM um, and, and then uh, hope for the best. I take 50 photos you know, out, off, off the beginning of the flight or something like that. Take something super small. Um, we also have a lot of, of sample data linked from the, the website and, and the forum that you can get to. So start with something really small, get your feet wet, you know, get a feel for how to use the software, um, and then expand from there. The default settings, as I mentioned, after you pick your photos, when you're starting your job, you, um, you can just leave it on default, let it go. Um, that's a perfectly wonderful set of uh, settings for people to start out with. And then as you, as you uh, use it more, you want to explore more, um, you increase the number of photos, start processing larger data sets. Um, just make sure it's make sure it's working for you on the small set first. Um, and then start to pick additional configuration options. Start you can start to explore the config options from there and just start small, start default. I added this slide um, right before the presentation, actually, because I think this is always valuable discussion for um, an organization like Red Cross um, or you know, any kind of international organization with an international presence and a lot of field offices and just kind of, I'll introduce it, um, Steve, but I'd like you to, I'd, to present your thoughts on this too, because um, I, I think it's very helpful. Um, the, the idea is here is you've got, typically you've got some people working in the field, you've got some kind of regional support, um, and then you've got either, you know, maybe, maybe continent level um, roll up or, or international level roll up. These are, you know, these levels are arbitrary, but the idea is that you've got folks in the field with certain hardware, you've got folks in a regional support capacity with certain hardware, and, and then globally. Um, and so people ask frequently, you know, like, where should I be installing WebODM? Should it be out here at each individual field station? Should it be in the region? Should it be some, com some kind of combination of these? So I'll, I'll introduce that as kind of the question, Stephen, if you have some thoughts on it, I'll let you. Yeah, I like I like this uh, I like this diagram. The um, I think that is one of those one of those core questions, and I think um, use case drives uh, drives your uh, use case and connectivity really drives sort of what level makes the most sense, uh, at least to my thinking. And I think uh, uh, Dan and maybe others can add to this, but 
Um, if I'm thinking, you know, if, if you're if you're fully remote in the field, you have you know nothing but nothing but a fat phone for six weeks at a time, then then if you want if you want your data processed in the field so that you can uh, digitize or otherwise use it in the field, then you're going to be field deploying compute. Uh, and so then the question becomes, you know, what compute, what's the lightest, smallest, lowest wattage thing that you can get away with? What can run on, you know, what can run on, 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 a, on a motorcycle battery as well as it does, uh, uh, you know, a line connection? What's, what's not going to tax the, the solar array in that remote area? And all those sort of logistical questions. If it's something that's okay to process later, then that network connectivity matters less, and you propagate that to the regional, uh, national, international um, level, uh, and you know you have the opportunity to process it there. Um, that's assuming, of course, that that the that the technical infrastructure is in place. So I think in my experience and conversations with folks, a lot of times what happens, kind of like deployment of cell phones, it starts <laughs> it starts with folks in the field trying to solve a problem. And then eventually it becomes something that's formalized, and then folks are like, "Okay, we really need, we re really need um, a central data center in West Africa for practicing this, and we also need one in D.C. and we need one in, you know, in, in Johannesburg, and we need one in in Dar. Um, and now, you know, now we've got now we've got the continent covered, and here's what we're going to do for here's our processes and projects and 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 um, and recommendations for field deployment." Um, but maybe maybe Dan can expand on that and talk a little bit about how um, how he sees that with his experience deploying. Um, yeah, I think you hit a lot of the key points. Um, kind of the level of resources and initial use cases, um, and how much adoption and uptake you have within kind of the the network that you are rolling this out to. Um, also the level of kind of technical capacity. Um, kind of the, the more local offices don't always have the people with the skill or with the time to invest in figuring out how to, to get this up and running well. Um, with um, like tech, with connectivity challenges, like sometimes you have to just end up using some sort of like slow sync, like even just what Dropbox provides and allowing them to kind of intermittently upload their images over time um, and then let someone more uh, more headquarters based, more regional based um, access those once they've all been uploaded and, and take it the rest of the way. Um, nice about like, you know, with it being open source and that there's like no individual licensing fees or anything like that, that if you want to deploy this in multiple places or have people within the wider network within your organization, uh, learn it, test it out. There's um, generally less financial implications uh, with uh, scaling that in, in that way. Very good. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, just a few more slides. If you're interested in, in uh, getting more information, I'll just run through them really quick. Um, Forum, probably the top resource. Uh, certainly, most of the users with questions, and uh, especially um, a lot of the folks who are most helpful in the community um, participate here. So, we see a lot of basic questions. There are a lot of questions that are already answered for you because it's an archive forum. Um, so, you can get a lot of information just by looking at the forum, but lots of people monitor it um, and help with questions, especially as you're getting started or if you run into some strange corner case. Um, community forum is, is very active and a great place to go. Oh, we have uh, docs online. They're like a lot of uh, project documentation. They could certainly could be better. Um, we have some plans to update those in the coming months, uh, but they exist currently. And especially if you want to uh, sort of deep dive into what specific options to, or um, if you have specific questions, ODM docs is a good place to go. As well, uh, and, probably, and they're not—they're not—they're not bad. We're just super self-critical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. There's always more to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, very comprehensive, very uh, organized deep dive into this. It's a book that Pierre put together. Um, 
It, this is a, a paid resource. There are a few paid resources through the, um, through the, available through the community, including this book, including uh, paid installers, uh, which simplify the installation process if you want to go that route. These, these funds um, go in, these funds support the community. So Piero spends a lot of time um, working on resources and, and uh, feature improvements in the software. So these are, while this is a commercial purchase, um, it definitely benefits the community. So uh, it's not just somebody off uh, randomly making, making money off of the uh, community and the project. So the ODM book is a great resource for getting started. This is a couple years old now, but this was a great um, project that took uh, the same data set and ran it through um, Open Drone Map, Pix4D, Drone Deploy, Edgesoft Metashape, and Drone Mapper. And, allows you to see kind of the, the, the literal outputs from each of those pieces of software um, and you have a little slider bar so you could literally scroll over the same ortho photo from ODM on the left, Pix4D on the right and do a visual comparison. So this is a question that, that comes up a lot like, it, okay, it's open source, is it as good as the commercial software? So this is a good place you can um, sort of kick the tires from, as I mentioned, I think that the comparison was done about two years ago, but. Um, definitely feature uh, parity, in my opinion, is a good place to see it. So that's the UAV arena. Um, so if you want to compare outputs, it's a good place you can do it. Um, other ways to get more information, um, sharing and training. We sometimes see organizations, see I'm, I'm not announcing this, I'm just suggesting this is something that might be possible. Um, you know, we see some organizations with kind of an internal special interest group of, you know, three or half a dozen people who are already working with Open Drone Map or interested in learning more about it and kind of sharing information. So something super informal, maybe you just get together and every couple months and kick around questions or something like that. But we see, I think internal special interest groups tend to work really well. Um, this, the Open Drone Map community can also provide more in-depth training and larger workshops and, and hands-on type stuff, either in, in person or remotely, but kind of extended and deeper versions of, of what you're experiencing right now are also available. Um, and then if you want to get involved in the community, if you're, you know, super interested and, and want to contribute back, um, just information, answering questions is great. Contributing your experiences or your data sets is great. Um, and uh, if you make, uh, you know, if your organization ends up making, um, pushing the code further in a certain direction, you want to contribute that back. It's an open source project. There's, you know, there are great frameworks for, for providing that information back and, and uh, getting it reviewed and approved. And um, we certainly appreciate it. So that's how to get involved. I'll, um, this is the Q and A slide. I think we're over time at this point. So I'll just give it back to Dan. We've got contact information for Steve and myself there. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to us directly or um, uh, through the forum as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this has been a really great presentation and I was excited to see like how far some of the stuff has come and I, it's been a while since I've touched on a few pieces. Things like being able to do the contours right there in the in the WebODM interface and export that um, really simplifies some of those, those processes people might be doing. Um, and I appreciate you all taking the time to, to present on this today. I think we've, uh, some of the group has trickled out as we, if we hit the hour, they probably have other meetings they have to jump to. Um, and I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so we can probably uh, go ahead and cut it there. And hey, oh, this is Kevin off of mine. I, I had one question, if you don't mind. Um, it, it's a little bit of a technical one. Um, so I can always email after if that's that's better. But I was, I was kind of curious um, if there's any way that you guys know of in software to assess the quality of the imagery or data you're collecting as you're collecting it. Um, a little bit more, some background, a little bit more of my experience in, in my day job. Um, I'm a volunteer uh, for the American Red Cross um, is with infrastructure and utility companies using drones for inspection and assessment and those kinds of things. And a big problem they have is not open drone map specific, but just collecting a bunch of data and then it not being useful. And they only find that out after post processing it. Um, so I was wondering if you guys know of a way, you know, to you know, in software without having a person look at it, assess the quality of data as you're collecting it to avoid having to, you know, refly things. 
I'll give a quick antidote, antidote, anecdote, and then uh, I'll let Steve speak to this too. I, I don't, um, unfortunately, and I do, you know, some mapping and field work and, and work with, you know, multiple pilots and collecting data sets. And that unfortunately is a problem everywhere with all kinds of stuff, with even, you know, drone deploy and other, um, even outside of the ODM world. I don't know of anybody that has a good solution for this um, beyond just that, you know, visual inspection, inspection and running through the data set at least quickly after it's been collected. Um, I, so yeah, I don't know, but I, I do recognize that it's a problem. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent thing to bring up because I think, I think um, catching it at the pipeline, uh, you know, at the, at the input is, is a super, is a real opportunity. Um, I could certainly see a package that sort of in near real time, at least, you know, before you leave the site, you've got enough information about what kind of overlap you've got to, to be able to refly as needed. Um, and it's, I mean, the, the kludgy solution is you can deploy open drone maps to the field, run it on a super low, um, uh, you know, super low settings on a laptop, um, run a subset of it and do some tests. That's sort of a low tech version. Um, but I think this is probably a gap in the ecosystem. And so it'd be, it'd be awesome if you hopped on the community and said, hey, we think this is a gap in the ecosystem um, because that might be something that's small enough that we could do a crowdfunding effort for. Um, build something from what we've already got and sort of have a, a, a turnkey thing that you could sit on a laptop and and at least have a sanity check on your on your data before you uh, before you ship out. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought to to kind of send that out to the community. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate and just know it. I, I can put it out there, but it's not the same coming from me. <laughs> Understood. I, I should uh, should make an account and get involved. Uh, that's something that I, in various communities, tend to like. I don't know why. I haven't really gotten as involved in online communities with things like this, but uh, this is a good impetus to do that. So appreciate it. And uh, otherwise, um, appreciate the presentation. Thanks very much. Really informative. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. And Brett, did you have a hand raised? Yeah, I was just gonna, you know, say, and I guess related to what Kevin had said, um, I'm obviously biased in this case. Uh, people don't know, Piero hired me to be the community manager and uh, support person for email support and work with Dan, or Dan's probably doing <laughs> a lot of the heavy lifting for me for the documentation. Um, but I do wanna say, you know, this project has probably the most incredible community I've ever been involved in. And that's what drew it to drew me to it in the first place. And Kevin, you know, anyone here, please, if you have the time, take the chance to explore it. Come introduce yourself, show off, ask questions. Um, people are really starting to sort of pick up the banner and help each other out. And it's a very organic and welcoming community that I, I feel is really unique in the online space. And you know, I just want to encourage everyone to try to try to take a look and see if maybe you know you feel welcome and if you don't feel welcome you know reach out to me reach out to someone and i'll do my best to make sure that we address what we can to make everyone feel welcome and everyone feel like they can contribute uh, openly and comfortably because that's that's the environment i want to try to foster yeah and i, I apologize i should have given brett and also india a shout out just to to sort of uh folks who, who signed into the call who are, have been an important part of of the community brett um you know brett showed up as a community member and then jero was like should i hire this guy and i was like yeah <laughs> yeah let's 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 formalize this he's, he's doing so much so much heavy lifting for the community and then it's been really great um to watch over the last few months um the proportion of questions answered by brett go down because the proportion of other folks answering the questions, uh, uh, you know, it, it has gone up, and and that's you know that's a testament to the to the work that he's been doing on the forums. So um, we hope to continue to we aim aim to continue to to foster that kind of community and that kind of um, that kind of responsiveness. So. Okay. Great. Thanks again. Awesome. And 
Uh, Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate the invitation and all the collaboration over the years. Hopefully cross paths again soon. Yeah, that's good. Bye, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone.